I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. My life is my own. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Carpo's channel. Carpo 719, to be specific. The greatest YouTube channel voted eight years in a row by everyone. <laughs> You'd be hard-pressed to prove that wrong. I guess that's kind of the premise of this discussion here, which is about bullshit claims and a lot of logical and illogical fallacies, filter bubbles, the, the shit that we're faced with in today's world. Not just with the lies, with the propaganda, with all the nonsense around us, but with this idea that we need to stop arguing, in the sense that the term argument seems to have a negative connotation associated with it, and I would like to dispel that. An argument was never intended to be two people shouting at each other and calling each other names. Um, an argument today tends to end up with fallacies whether it's an ad hominem attack on the individual or reverting back to some completely irrelevant straw man argument, whatever it might be. We're all kind of in this... I guess many of us are having this realization that the world that we thought we might enter may not be possible. In other words, the more information that we're provided, the more facts and figures we have in front of us, we thought that perhaps people would start making better decisions and uh, become a, a little more thoughtful and rational in the way that they operate. Uh, but this has not seemed to be the case. It seems to be the opposite. Now, let's talk about filter bubbles first. One of the most difficult things about discussing anything with people these days is our filter bubbles, which have become even worse than they ever could have been in the past. And let me give you an example of what I'm uh, where I'm coming from here. It was back in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s uh, when the internet, you know, first became available mainstream and everybody started getting online. And you would often hear this thing, you know, this term, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Now, of course, this wasn't anything new. This went back to newspapers. Uh, you know, it, it's always been the case that people need to be aware of what they're reading, what they're watching, who they're listening to. But back in the uh, early days of the internet, um, <clears throat> it's true that you could find a lot of BS on there. But the thing was, when you searched for something, when you, uh, you know, Googled something, whatever it might be, uh, you would come up with whatever was available, whatever websites were actually there, rather than a filtered down, personalized version of what Google expects you to see. And Google themselves... Uh, which this is well known that they create these, you know, filter bubbles for people. So when you Google something from your browser, it's going to be different results than someone else's. This is a majorly, you know, the, the intention was to sell you more shit and uh, to get you on board to, you know, document everything that you do, basically anything you post on Facebook, uh, anybody who's dumb enough to take a personality quiz, all of these things end up coming back to haunt us because basically they're just bits of information about us that are being collected. Uh, that's one thing, but on top of the collection of information, there's also the personalized news feed, if you will. And this is YouTube everywhere. Uh, YouTube has become much worse. YouTube actually used to have a decent algorithm. When I searched for something, I'd watch a video, and then the next video that came up might be uh, the same band, a different song, or something I haven't heard yet. Now, my entire suggestion list and the up next, it's always something I've already seen. It keeps people in these perpetual loops of the same shit. Whether intentional or not isn't the point that I'm trying to make. The idea is that we're all exposed to whatever illusion we've set for ourselves. Now, if you've ever heard the saying, uh, a lie, well, I'm just going to say it my own way. Uh, I guess a lie can make it around the earth before the truth has it, you know, gets off the shitter in the morning. Uh, it's this old, the lie can make it halfway around the earth before the truth has a chance to put its pants on, was one way I heard it. What it just means is that 
any type of extreme story that gets people excited, that pulls heartstrings, gets you emotional or angry. Um, and it's usually the angry, the frustration, because sad stories are not shared nearly as much as angry stories. So anything that pisses people off, they're willing to share. Um, and if it's a lie, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. This is what we've realized, you know, through a lot of research of old stories, of old, you know, claims that were made by, you know, politicians, by actors, by whoever it might be. And when they came back to try to mend that by saying I was wrong, it's too late, it doesn't matter. The genie's out of the bottle, uh, people get this stuck in their mind that this is the way things are. So once a lie is out, you can't bring it back in. And this means it's ever more important that we as individuals are responsible with what we say, which means that we're responsible with what we know, which means we have to be responsible with our research. And that also means that we have to be careful about our arguments. And uh, <clears throat> in the internet world today, it's all about whatever gets clicks. And that's how we doomed ourselves. Um, it's the fact that, you know, I understand advertising runs the internet. It's always been that way. And being a person I am who doesn't ever want to sell out to corporations and who really hates advertisements, I, I'm, I'm the loner in this, you know. It's not like I would ever say, hey, everybody join me. Of course not. People are making their money off of the corporations. Let them. But the problem isn't necessarily the products themselves or the money that's being made. It's the fact that we're constantly bombarded and inundated with these ads that pose as informational videos, that pose as news. And it's one thing when they're trying to get our attention, but they manage to get us to get each other's attention whether they're selling you audiobooks or a course or uh, whatever it might be, it's, it's just sad where we've ended up in the pockets of the same corporations. But um, anyhow, I don't want to get off track and into that whole corporate realm, but um, what we've done with this, these filter bubbles and these, uh, you know, this extreme heart, heart string pulling or frustration making uh, information, supposedly, posing as news, um, what we've done is we've created what they call a tribal epistemology. It's this tribalism that's not based on an actual protection of the whole, or the group, or the nation, or the community, but rather tribalism based on our preconceived notions and our tendency to believe what other people are telling us. So what it is is it's simply lazy, lazy thinking. And um, we can see it. It basically means the group is right, no matter what. And I've seen this never worse than in politics in recent years, from the left and the right, for example. You know, if somebody within the group says something, people bite their tongue, they might not want to resist it, they don't, they don't want to speak against their own crew, their own group, because that will make them the outcast, the independent, the loner, the person who doesn't, you know, who's not a team player. But in reality, it's just an individual who is, has the courage to pose an argument against something that his own group believes. And that to me is the ultimate hero. That's what we're here for. We're here to, or I should say, that's, that's what the discussions are for. That's what we argue for, is to make points that are maybe better than one that we thought was true. Um, so, uh, among all of the nonsense out there, we've got, you know, of course, lots of clickbait, um, tons of misattributed quotes, where you'll read a quote and it'll say it's from you know, whether it's from Einstein or Lincoln, and then you'll do a little deep research and you find out that, wait, nobody knows who really said that, or maybe nobody ever said that. Um, and then we have the top ten lists, the shock value, you know, type like challenges, whatever it might be. And it's easier for people to click on these things. You know, it's like, it's, it's mind, you know, it's like the dopamine rush of seeing something exciting or uh, maybe it's even somebody, uh, you know, so-and-so gets demolished or destroyed by this other person and it's all about seeing, haha, this one person reveling in attacking another person. But not for the sake of any truth coming out, but for the sake of seeing another person wrong. And uh, that's where we're at, you know, is nobody wants to be wrong. I can respect that, but sometimes we are. Somebody has to be wrong. So, uh, anyhow, th what we found is that the ideas that are simpler to recall, like I was saying, when people, um, people have a false idea that's put in their head, it doesn't matter if you try to fix that. You've already put it out there. 
And those ideas are simpler to recall than reformulating our thoughts to having, okay, well, now I've changed my mind. And actually, you know, if we think a certain way for several years and then somebody tells us something different, we don't just change our mind overnight unless we're very on top of our minds. I mean, that's something that takes practice. You can do it, but it's easy to want to hang on to what we thought was true because it's emotional, and especially when it's emotional. And that's the propaganda tool that's been played forever. So the, light, the lazy thinking, the tribalism, it's, it ends up just being a defense of opinions, not a defense of facts. And uh, this is the interesting conclusion I can, you know, because we use emotional reasoning for a lot of things, and that's actually kind of a, a fallacy in itself or, a, you know, <laughs> uh, you can't really put those, those two together. It's just you can't reason with your emotion. They're two separate things. But if you have developed your emotional intelligence enough, then you can use that emotion to dictate whether something may be appropriate or not. But that's a different discussion. Um, <clears throat> and this is why stoicism matters. This is why I've mentioned this in the past. Why not just to be stoic in the sense of not caring or, you know, being completely resistant to all of life's problems, but to letting the little shit go. Like the one I made the other day about just the art of not giving a fuck, basically. It means that you let go of the small shit so you can really deal with the problems or the issues that you find important. And don't let anybody tell you different. Stick with what you think is important and other people can just fuck right off. Unless they have a better argument as to why you shouldn't. And you should be listening to that too. But the key is we have to separate the subject from ourselves. I cannot stress that enough. That's probably the main takeaway from this video that I would like to uh, share with people in my experience is you cannot attach yourself to your ideas. Now, if you have a belief about some scientific discovery and somebody shows you that you're wrong, for example, it's not too hard to say, okay, now I have new evidence, what I thought was wrong, and kind of change your thinking. It's completely different if a person spent a lifetime in a particular religion, and then they're given information that may counter what they believe. Nobody's going to change their mind overnight and just say, oh, well, this person's right. But that's not the goal. The goal is to plant a seed so the person can think about it. Because the person who's non-religious may be wrong. Who knows? The point being that if somebody says something about something we believe and we get frustrated or angry, it's time to look deep inside and see why we get angry about a subject. Because the subject is not you. You see what I'm saying? You are an individual. The subject is the subject. The more we attach ourselves to this, that's what identity politics does to us. Identity politics you know, identity and religion, and uh, <clears throat> and what we think is important. You know, these values that we try to impose on others, just, it doesn't work. We have to do what we find to be important. And um, as I was going to say a minute ago, this, we, it's interesting, I, you know, re I read 1984 by, you know, Orwell, maybe 20 years ago. I should probably read it again, but it's just that constant quote, everybody's always quoting 1984 and double speak and Big Brother came from that, but the thing that I realized recently, and it's unfortunate to admit this, but we the people, we imposed the Orwellian world on ourselves. It's not that the internet started censoring us or that the government held us back from speech or uh, we we chose to give up our privacy and what we believe to be important as a society in order to be comfortable. And that's really the whole basis for that Orwellian argument. You know, just let me be fed and clothed and I'll do whatever the state says. And uh, plenty of people are doing that today. I mean, I'm not going to turn this political because I've had a lot of time to think about the current president and the issues at hand. and completely understand where people are coming from when they want change. They said, well, we're going to bring an outsider in because, you know, the system isn't working. Maybe this will fix it. I, I, I respect that point of view because I hate the system too. You know, the stand, everybody's walking around in suits and ties and, you know, saying one thing and doing another and the rest of us are just caught in the middle. So I guess what I'm saying here is not to get political. It's just that political arguments, if we're going to have them, we've got to stop making it personal got to stop making it about the cucks or the snowflakes or, you know, screaming that everybody on the right is a racist. I mean, this kind of shit has just got to stop. It's completely bullshit. And, but it's not going to because there's that emotion that is pulled from people 
not from what they truly know about these subjects, but you'll hear constant people quoting about, you know, certain policies or embargoes or tariffs or trade and all these things that normally people wouldn't even talk about unless it was in the news. And on one hand, people will say, oh, the news is fake. And then the other side, they're, they're repeating these media stories that we hear. It's not our fault, okay? My point is it's, you know, I, I'm trying to understand people from every walk of life because I don't think that half the population or half the world are idiots. Well, I do. But I don't think that they're bad people, all right? You know, uh, no, I don't really think that half the world are idiots. I, I think we don't give people enough credit for the intelligence they have. So anyway, the message I want to carry here is that a debate is really important. They say, you know, I read this and I don't know if it's true because it's just another internet statistic, but that they found that, you know, in uh, places where only 50% of students graduate, uh, don't remember if it was high school, was high school or, you know, what, what area it was in or what, 90, up to 90% of people who take debate club or debate classes during their schooling actually graduate. and. I'm sure that the, you know, the difference is probably not as great as it may seem, but the point being that people who learn to debate young and early in their lives and debate well, they're not affected by the same turmoil as people who are basically treated like snowflakes, if you will, the way that many kids are brought up, what a lot of people attribute as the millennial generation or generation that, you know, is spoiled. I don't buy into that. There's a lot of really good kids out there. There's a lot of really spoiled adults out there. There's no generational thing there. But the kids growing up today do have a different circumstance than we did. So, uh, <clears throat> anyhow, um, taking debate courses in school I would highly urge because it means that when you get out of school and somebody tells you and calls you a fag or something because you happen to be gay or someone you know, uh, calls you a racial slur because you happen to be a different color, uh, you don't have to feel completely overwhelmed by the fact that somebody's, you know, pointing the finger at you. The fact that you learn to argue means that you can pipe back and say, well, fuck you, you prick, you know, and put people in their place for the shit that they say. And, uh, you know, live and let live is such a simple thing, but people do not abide by it, you know? I mean, especially the religious crew, you know, the, the, the extreme religion, uh, the, the extremely religious within this country um, can just completely go overboard when it comes to, let's say, a debate. In fact, earlier this morning, I woke up early with back pain, so I, like 4.30, couldn't get back to sleep. Uh, so a couple hours after that, I watched this, uh, as painful as it was, I watched an hour-long debate, or discussion maybe, between... Um, well, Michael Shermer, who is a skeptic, he's written several books on skepticism, and to be honest, I find him a little bit, in the past, he's been a little bit overwhelming and kind of arrogant, but you've got to be when you're arguing with guys like Dennis Prager, which is who he was debating. Um, and I just wanted to hear what, it, you know, what their debate would be like, because Dennis Prager is uh, this old guy who runs what they call PragerU or Prager University. It's basically an online uh, an online YouTube channel posing as a university. And it's extreme right-wing propaganda. Um, it's funded by, I think, the Koch brothers and some other places. Uh, they pose some of their ads as actual, you know, information, but really he's a, he's a extremely religious and he's got this viewpoint that God has to exist because otherwise it wouldn't hurt his feelings. And I, I just found that just you know, he said that once. He's like, he goes, well, God has to exist because if he didn't, I just wouldn't be able to handle it. I wouldn't be able to, 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 to do this. But anyway, the debate was about morality. And it was really fascinating to hear somebody just get completely annihilated by their own stupidity. And um, I'm going to get to the point here. It's not to attack religion because they had this discussion and missed the point entirely. After an hour hour long discussion, I was just like, but but why don't you say this? The discussion got too much about irrelevant components. Anyhow, um, he believes, Prager believes, that without religion, we would have no morals. And he kind of gives this attitude that it would just be chaos, that we would just what run around killing each other and maiming and raping and harming everybody. 
and then we have Michael Shermer who's trying to give the argument of animals who actually help one another, you know, or get frustrated when things aren't fair. The fact that it's not just humans that see equality and fairness, but it just goes right over the guy's head. The idea that religion gives us morals is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Because it was our own sense of morals that we put into religion. But I don't want to get too much into that. The argument became about whether God exists or not, right? And uh, he's saying, you know, if you know, God has to exist because this universe is too complex. And he's like, Dennis was saying, how can you look out at this universe and think that it was just by random chance? And he has this incredulous idea, you know, this he just cannot believe that that atheists exist and that they can live in this world. They must all be immoral. And they must uh, all be confused because they don't believe that... They think that basically all this just popped into existence from nothing. And to be honest, I, I, that's what I mean about missing the point entirely. Take me, for example. You know, the discussion came up. They were talking about... He's, he's like, I can almost respect agnosticism. And uh, Shermer was saying, well, most people actually are more agnostic. It just means I don't believe anything. But if you can show me the truth, I'll look at it. It's that simple seems pretty simple to me. But what do I mean about missing the argument? I mean that all, all, you know, all Shermer has to do is say, look, you could be right. The universe may be intelligent, and it may have a designer, and it may be being created as we speak. Obviously, it's evolving, so it's still being created, right? So perhaps the universe itself is conscious. Why does it have to be the biblical version of God? You know, the one who says don't kill, but sent, <laughs> sent someone to kill his brother and basically tells you to dash, you know, kids against the rocks or, you know, these horrible stories that are in the Bible, but those are completely ignored and defended because it's all about thou shalt not kill. And they were trying to get to the bottom of what does that really mean? Shermer was saying in all cases or is it just in some cases, you know, and uh, these are some issues. Cognitive dissonance arises when you start to say, well, thou shalt not kill, but what if somebody's harming my family? Well, then it's time to kill, right? And uh, so his idea, you know, uh, Dennis Prager, is that reason cannot give you morals. And maybe he's right, but there's something else. It's called society. It's called community. And when he says that without religion, we wouldn't know the difference between good and evil, the argument was completely ignored that you have a different religion on the other side of the planet who believes the exact same thing. But both of you think... The other one is the evil one, the wrong one. How do you reconcile that? How do you ever reconcile that difference? But it's never brought up. It's not about maybe there's a God, maybe there is a higher power, but it's not your God. And that's the conclusion I've come to, that the universe, it is aware of my existence, of course. I mean, seeing the interconnectedness in nature, it's like I don't have to argue against nature being intelligent. But do I believe God is a man, or that he's in the sky watching me, or that there's a heaven that I go to and I'm judged, or pearly gates? No, of course not. Those are man-made constructs, but if people want to believe that, they're free to. That's not my, my discussion here. It was mainly bringing that in to say that it was a horrible debate because they missed the point. An argument, a good argument, should have a result, you know, but if you're both stuck in what you believe, there's rarely a result. So... I remember when uh, Prager said during there, he said that the inner voice would never tell him to do, to do good or something to that effect where without believing in God, he wouldn't want to do good. And I thought, you know, this sounds like a personal problem to me. I mean, I, I don't have that. I'm, I'm not religious, and yet I would never want to harm someone. So anyhow, those are my thoughts on it. My camera's about to run out of battery. Um, all I wanted to say is that the truth doesn't care about your feelings. And that's what we have to realize. And uh, the idea that nobody knows anything, that fallacy has to go away too. Uh, I hear that a lot now. That, well, things are complicated and we just can't know. And that's a cop-out. We all know it. So, um, recognize generalizations. Recognize the fallacies. And learn to have a good argument without taking it personal. And maybe we can resolve some things. There are no real simple answers. Um... <laughs> They all take a lot of thought. So be well, my friends. I'll talk to you all later.
Thanks for coming to Carlos Channel, yo. Yeah.